All right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, our names are Haddon Charbot and Deborah Lopez, and we're both architects. And currently, we're teaching at the Bartlett BPRO program and leading the research cluster RC1. And normally, we're teaching and working out of London at the moment, but because of the situation, we've been uh, kind of relocated to Spain and going on week number five. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it threw off my groove. Uh, so, so basically, the situation at the moment is um, well, we're having this conversation with Jesse Le Cavalier, and we're really excited about it actually because we had the chance of meeting Jesse in 2017 at the Sol Biennale. And at that moment, um, when we met, he was presenting his work. I believe it was just the conclusion of it, or it was just um, about concluding on uh, his research on logistics. And since then, we haven't really had a chance to, um, to kind of catch up. So we're really curious to see uh, where he's at today. And um, from looking at it from a distance, we feel like there are some parallels. And so we're really excited that he's um, going to be joining this conversation. And uh, the format for today's conversation is something like a lecture for 20 minutes on our side, something like 20 minutes on his side, and then we'll have a discussion about our work and the topic of closed frictions. And we'd also like to thank Connections for hosting this and creating an opportunity for us, um, for both of us, uh, Rick Avedia and ourselves, to kind of share our recent work and uh, create an occasion for us to have this conversation. Okay, so uh, Parade uh, is actually researching and doing different projects, and oftentimes we are uh, carrying out uh, everything by methods or collaborations with other disciplines. The studio, or at least how we conceive it, is something transformative and nomadic in scope and scale, and through various interfaces and mediums, try to render changing views of the world around us. And yeah. basically, uh, we are going to... Um... This is tricky, huh? Sorry. This is so tricky. Okay, so we would like to elaborate on this theme through the example of the Great Horse Manor Crisis of 1894, as described by Brian Gung in an article published in 2013 in the Financial Times. He writes, uh, in the 19th century, cities depended on horses for transporting people and goods uh, in London. Then the largest city in the world had 11,000 cabs, all horse powered and several thousand buses, each of which required 12 horses a day. New York had a population of 100,000 horses that produced 2.5 million pounds of manure a day. With this, the stage for the 20th century world uh, covered by manure was set. For instance, every street in London in the next 50 years will be buried under nine feet of manure. Whereas in New York, the amount of horse manure will reach the level of Manhattan third story windows. What is interesting about all of this imaginary is that we're built on a quote that actually never existed. So the fact that this uh, crisis never actually existed was only found out in 2018 when um, the chief editor of the archives, Rose Wilde, of the Times Magazine, she started investigating the story as a result of a curious reader who tried to trace down um, the origins of that quote. And actually, I mean, what's interesting about this also is that, so the Times Magazine in 2018 uh, actually found out that they misquoted themselves. And that's kind of this weird paradoxical moment in um, publishing, uh, let's say, news and media. Um, so just to specify a bit, it's definitely true that the streets of London were filled with horses and therefore excrement as well. But it was more just part of the everyday urban life and it wasn't um, going down this kind of crisis road that it had depicted to be. Um, so the transformation from an everyday norm into a crisis as such uh, was kind of used to project future pandemics and is, a rel and is actually a relic of a fictitious moment in history, which since then has been requoted and propagated to the point where it's transcended from the imaginary into the real. So here we're looking at a couple of articles where this story kind of um, just is used today to kind of prop up other contemporary issues. Um, and of course, looking at today's circumstances, uh, it couldn't be better timing uh, because on the one hand, 
we have issues like climate change. And uh, on the other hand, we also have the coronavirus, of course. And we have issues about how automation is going to be uh, potentially replacing human labor. And so with these issues all at play, we're entering a territory where um, this kind of fake story is starting to gain more and more traction in its potential to influence the real. For better or worse, it's not the question at hand, but rather is to recognize that such occurrences are active forces operating in our day-to-day. -day. For instance, here, the two views of Bangkok skyline on a clear day. And here, the same two views in a more recent days, uh, where the haze and pollution has made itself clear in its capacity to modify our perception of the city, literally to disappear in the buildings from our field of view. This presents a synchronous and biased moment that is shared among all of inhabitants, and though media and social conversations are exchanged, trying to sort out possibilities, concerns, and ways of action through various figures and pollution data applications, there is a question here of what role architecture plays in reassembling the collective in a moment of spontaneity. So we, we began questioning if those very bodies that move, breathe, inhabit, and navigate the various territories of the city, sorry, the various territories of the city, could not be understood as some form of environmental record in themselves. Not only that, but we were actually wondering if consuming and the things that we secrete and the things that we shed from our bodies could actually be used as a material in themselves. Along these lines, we started exploring the possibility of human hair, which culturally and historically has its own interpretations, its value and its significance, um, even up to present day. And materially, it's something that we all grow, stylize, cut and discard repeatedly. And although uh, it's biodegradable and it could be used for other things, most of it just ends up in the trash in a kind of non-discriminate pile of mixed unwanted waste. So looking at it closer though, we find out that actually hair is a complex matrix, matrix and it retains a huge amount of elements that the body is constantly secreting, such as heavy metals. And with this, we began developing follicle, which is still ongoing and our longest project today. The idea was to use uh, discarded human hair as an architectural material that is both sustainable and inherently possessing some degree of affection. In the construction of a pavilion that will be used as an experimental laboratory and a parliament in order to map the, tox the city's toxicity uh, in, in order to generate what we call at that time a toxic cartography. The pavilion operates itself as a beacon where uh, in the public will enter and voluntarily participate in a protocol uh, for hair sampling. A device at the center contains questionnaire, pairs of scissors, mirror, everything almost necessary for anonymously provide a hair sample. And once the samples were collected, they were sent to a toxicologist to be analyzed. The data from which uh, will be used in order to produce this publicly accessible toxic cartography. Here, what we are seeing are the different samples with questionnaires uh, and asking people where they live, uh, where they work, if there is inside, outside, or in between and uh, all of these questions. And basically, uh, by the end of the event, we had upward uh, 200 samples, and we are now at the moment where we receive 50 results and with some initial insights, as well as another 50 samples that are sent to be analyzed. So with that, uh, it's important for us to note that the follicle project uh, is possible to achieve basically through a very multifaceted collaboration. On the one hand, uh, we got some support and uh, the felting machine that was pictured in one of the previous slides from an organization called Matter of Trust and they operate out of San Francisco and they actually receive loads of hair donations that they use for their own purposes um, and they were kind enough to send that machine over and at the same time uh, we reached out to a toxicologist a doctor and professor Alberto Salamone who's a chemist teaching at the University of Turin and he's been helping us uh, of course process the analysis, but also at the same time, process the data and try to understand what is that relationship. Um, the, hair the hair donations we actually got from a company in, based out of Bangkok, who's receiving hair from Laos, Cambodia, and so forth. And um, finally, of course, without the participation of the public, who were quite curious to know how toxic they were, um, we received all these extra samples. And finally, this pavilion um, is also going to be featured at the Spanish uh, pavilion for the Venice Biennale for this year. So we're looking forward to that as well. So if the idea of architecture as a moment for collections and the collective uh, 
uh, it's one thing that we were exploring. Uh, we continue with this idea for uh, our next project, that is Pylones, which is uh, th which was examining water as a resource and its climatic counterparts such as monsoon, droughts, and climate. This is especially relevant uh, to the context of a school in a rural Thailand. Uh, the red dot on the bottom is Bangkok, and the red dot on the top is uh, the, the site where we were located which we found interesting because it was basically sandwiched between this building and a garden. The school uh, basically uh, hosts two generations of students on one campus, which basically implies various timetables, activities that are sometimes independent, sometimes overlapping, and what, what they were basically needed it was a canteen. Uh, and basically here you can see one of the students getting lunch, but there was basically not a space uh, for it to eat. No? So we began conceiving on how this open-ended space could remain flexible while mediating the specific of its ecological context, especially with respect to uh, its most valuable resource, which was water. Another interesting set of constraints was the limitation in machinery and labor. Uh, for instance, everything had to be mounted by hand and montable uh, with just a few people. The influence, this influenced uh, the geometry, how it was conceived, uh, as well as uh, the structure and the makeshift of the scaffolding. Here we are looking at the sports structure made up of a series of modules uh, with two inverted umbrellas on the course. And this is the building with its roofing, which basically works as two large uh, panels. This exploded axo uh, shows the relationship between the structure and its performance. And the water into the building is made visible, then guided out to uh, two embedded channels, uh, which basically lead the water to a filtration tank system. Uh, in the garden hosting a combination of endemic plants to be viewed and interacted via various pockets and pathways. The plan uh, echoes the uh, multi-direction mediation, uh, having no clear front and back and prompt, and prompt uh, various forms of connectivity, both visual and physical. Uh, here, for instance, we are looking uh, from the edge of the adjacent building through the structure into the garden. As we were wandering around the school grounds, we came across these kind of abandoned pieces of exercise equipment. And so what we decided to do was to refurbish them and connect them to the pumps that kind of acted as a link between the building, the act of collecting water, and the garden itself. And of course, some kind of degree of exercise or fun. Um, this hybrid typology we started to refer to as a gardenasium. And it's um, curiously working quite well. The, the kids seem to be having a good time. So that's nice. And uh, this strategy basically allows us to bypass dealing with uh, electricity for pumping the water back out. Um, instead, you just have to work out. And the more you work out, the more you can pump the water back out into the garden. And basically, the alternative to that would be having to hoist the water quite high up. And that would demand a huge structure. So this kind of bypasses that as well. Um, this diagram kind of shows the overall ecosystem of the project, from water collecting to filtration to the activating of the gym and the garden itself. In a similar spirit, the furniture was designed to accommodate different types of formations that could see the space transform from a classroom or to a canteen or a performance hall. Um, here you can see those modular bits of furniture and you can already see some students moving them around and finding their own kind of, um, what do you call them, bottom-up types of arrangements. Uh, we like this idea of challenging the present notion of a hierarchy, especially within the confines of the school. And we thought that giving agency to both the students and to the staff could be an interesting way to create a new dialogue about what types of functions um, should this space hold and how does organization play a role in that. Um, so, the look of the project was definitely um, quite pylon-esque, and that was a kind of conscious nod to the surrounding electrical pylons and water towers that populate the region. And it kind of gave us the sense of an industrial vernacular, and that's basically how the name of the project came about. Uh, so the considerations here were to test how architecture could reconceptualize a multifaceted ecology and provide possibilities for action and interaction. And this has us questioning the notion of what vernacular and resources mean today. If the previous projects that we showed, Follicle and Pylon-esque, if those are more about collection and application of materials, then what do we see when we're looking down the other end of this network and where those materials are prospected from? And that's really the topic of our research at the moment entitled Monumental Wastelands. 
Um, so just to elaborate a bit on what it means to be monumental, uh, originally the nine points of monumentality were published in 1943 <clears throat> and they defined a monument as intended to outlive the period which originated them and constitute a heritage for future generations, forming a link between the past and the future. So in 1937, the World's Fair in Paris basically saw the two largest European superpowers battle it out in a form of monumental battle. Um, so on the left-hand side, in the left image, we can see the left pavilion, which is the Third Reich's pavilion, and the one on the right, which was the Soviet pavilion. And these two are kind of facing off in front of the icon of the site, which is, of course, the Eiffel Tower. Um, so what was interesting about this is that those authors of the of those nine points of monumentality were quite critical of this uh, because they felt that it was lacking some kind of cultural expression or expression of the society's cultural needs of the time. And with this and under a contemporary lens, we're trying to wonder if this monumentality for a cultural expression or a reflection of our cultural needs isn't already in place. And that's kind of what we see here on the right hand side is this marble query where we've already started expressing ourselves um, and our needs through the excavation of this raw material. And these are other types of minds or queries where we can see the, the extent of how these basically new forms of land are, are emerging as that type of monumental expression. A case that we examined with our students was the PPI lands of, in the southern coast of Thailand specifically Maja Bay, uh, which is the place where the movie The Beach starring Leonardo DiCaprio was filmed, and which since has become what we could call a manufactured nature as a byproduct of uh, Hollywood industry. Presented through uh, the screen and its narrative as an ideal and picturesque paradise, and since seen uh, more than uh, 1.5 million foreign and domestic annual tourist visits, and the, con the consequences of which uh, have radically changed the living conditions of humans, non-humans, and the biotope, and as a result, uh, in the, the indefinite closing of the beach uh, to the public. We began investigating what the future of this, this beach will be. For instance, in this case, uh, Nani uh, was examining what constitutes the ideal beach and deconstructed into a series of essential spatial effects, some of which were virtual, some physical, starting with the visual closing of the bay by composing another mountain into the scene, and then by physically uh, reshaping the island through the displacement and relocation of trees and massing. In analyzing the ideal blue through both the film and the social media content uh, generated by the public since the film release, the blue we perceive is defined by a combination of depth, uh, sand color, algae, minerals, and suspended, suspended living particles. Or uh, in terms of the pixel and the screen that mediates it, an RGB of 79, 174, and 129. As a result of this, a sudden flux of its overall ecosystem from terraforming and a rush of mass tourism, the beach has become close as to the public since 2019 and led to the speculative proposition that eventually the desire to visit the island would create enough demand to where we begin living out of our own versions of the beach in an hybrid and augmented virtual real experience hosted in abandoned infrastructures of the Thai coast, the, of the Thai coast which basically means the future home of everyone's personal Maya Bay for renting or purchase. In a different scenario, Title was looking at the materiality of our plastic wastelands. For instance, Kelly Schersbach discovered plastic gomerate uh, in Camilo Beach in Hawaii in 2013. A combination of plastic, beach, sediment, sand, basalt, rock, wood, and coral. Geologists believe that uh, it could be an imperishable marker of our impact on the earth. And this student began investigating if this material could then start to become our active part of the built environment and part of architecture palette in any form of monument architecture. Oh, looks like the screen is frozen, just a second. There we go. So from examining the ecologies of materials, biotopes, cultural consumption and byproducts, we also started to question what role preservation has in this process and how that might be, or how that might be used to reshape um, what wastelands do and how they transcend the physical into the virtual. So for example, in 2019, the world tuned in as Notre Dame's fire burned and effectively erased part of the setting for its homes of novels and countless photographs of visitors of this Gothic cathedral. Um, so the student here, uh, Mint, 
She started with an analysis on how the human eye and body navigates various forms of art from the 2D to the 3D and from the figural to the sensual. Um, this idea led to the exploration of capturing, manipulating, and rendering specific qualities of these various, let's call them monuments, um, and how they might eventually start to become extrapolated, blended together, and eventually form a new type of monument, maybe a hyper monument and uh, started to lend itself to this idea that what if this desire for preservation became a style in itself and it started to propagate? And maybe the style of preservation would be referred to as preco, such as preservation through colonization. So the very act of preserving becomes an active form of architectural making. And whether physical or virtual or both, um, these new forms of attractions would be able to eventually lead themselves where you could even have your own copy of a mini monument. So this is being presented more as a small souvenir rather than an actual thing in itself. In fact, um, the most detailed copy of Notre Dame Spire is owned by Ubisoft and was featured in Assassin's Creed, the video game, which is part of what will end up being used to reconstruct the Spire. And what's even more interesting about this is that uh, the world is currently on lockdown, of course, and we've already in a weird way started to explore what this new virtual realm of monumental visiting and tourism uh, could start to be like. These examples bring us to our current and ongoing research at the Bartlett B Pro, uh, which examines related topic under the lens of permafrost stone. What we find interesting is how something as simple as ice melting has implications in such a vast scale of areas. Uh, one team is focusing on human perception, is looking at how different kinds of ice and formation and are used as formal and navigational language. Uh, another team is researching on non-humans. It's, it's looking at how climate change can actually offer new opportunities where new life forms will eventually be able to thrive and areas uh, where the, they previously could not be sustained, basically by reconceptualizing our relationship with nature. We are also investigating change in the earth formation. Some are studying the impacts of evolving landscape and migratory patterns. And uh, another team is basically examining logistics and the paradox in environmental law and national sovereignty. So um, just nearing the end, basically the last thing we'd like to share is a very quick introduction into our latest research, which is in its very, very, very early stages. Um, but that started through kind of this same idea of uh, looking back at different archives. And in this case, we're scanning through these different archives that are of news sources, research papers, and so on, um, that are looking at the relationship or trying to make a relationship between digital carbon footprints and climate change. And learning from the horse, well, the great horse manure crisis of 1894, uh, we're encountering a plethora of content that has different types of information and different types of connections, some of which are very solid and others that are a bit flimsy. And so it kind of gets us thinking about this idea of how these fictitious scenarios start to build up our realities. Um, what's been interesting, of course, uh, and maybe a good way of summarizing this presentation, is just to consider in general how the speed of information, material flow, the vastness of today's various forms of networks, and our individual and collective habits and responses have these implications that are perpetually being re-rendered in real time. And with that, uh, we'd basically like to thank you for your attention. And if you're interested in knowing more about these monumental wastelands or this toxic cartography, then you could visit these sites. Um, they'll both hopefully be active by the end of August. And thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so now we stop sharing screen. All right. Great. Let me just toggle my own screen here. Do you guys see that okay? Yeah, can you guys see the screen okay? Okay.
awesome. Um, great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm I'm uh, my name is Jesse Le Cavalier. I'm I'm so delighted to be able to join. Uh, Deb, uh, Deborah and Haddon for this and, and Ken Actions for this conversation. Um, and it's really, it's really a kind of um, one of the serendipitous aspects of this super weird moment that we can be having a conversation uh, between people in Kiev and Spain and I'm here in Toronto, uh, Canada. And it's really, uh, it's one of, it's like, I really feel very lucky that, that um, out of this we can reconnect and, and have um, conversations about, I think, where there's a lot of shared interests and um, ideas about how to deal with these situations that we're in. And so, um, so with, with that, I'd, I'd love to um, just set a timer. I'm going to um, talk about three, three things, hopefully today, quickly. One is um, work that I've been doing on questions of logistics and the supply chain and um, collected to some extent in um, a book of mine called The Rule of Logistics. And then I'd like to talk about two design projects. One um, was my contribution to the PS1 Young Architects program from uh, two years ago. And uh, currently a project underway, which has to do with the Meadowlands uh, in New Jersey, which is what you see on the screen, which is in its own way, uh, a monumental wasteland, almost kind of paradigmatically. And, um, and, then, I, and then I'm really excited to be able to talk with, with Deborah and Helen about, about their work and, and the, the our, you know, shared kind of interests and curiosities and, and, and concerns about all of this, because I feel like there is, um, you, a lot of these questions, I think, are, are really increasingly um, crucial. So I'll just add a little bit about what um, some of the things I do. I, um, I'm currently in, uh, an associate professor at the, at the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto, where I teach uh, across the curriculum um, undergraduate urban design classes, but then I also am the director of our new PhD program. So if, if for anyone out there listening, uh, consider us if you're curious about post 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 uh, graduate work in a doctoral level. The, the idea of the program is to foster interdisciplinary research, um, exactly like the kind you just saw. So so um, so that's also why I'm very excited to be able to join this conversation because I think the kind of work that that Parade is doing, I think, embodies some of the kind of work that we'd like to support at the school. Um, so in addition to that, um, I, I work in a kind of research capacity through writing and, and um, things like this. And then I, I have a, my design practice, Le, Le Cavalier R&D, which is sort of both research and design, and then, and then teaching um, across different levels, um, including the, the image you see on the right of the screen, uh, which is from a recent uh, studio. So I, I also would like to make a plug for a recent project. This is called uh, landscapesoffulfillment.org. And it's a, it's a website and online exhibition about um, work that I did with a kind of collective research project with students from Yale University that looks at different aspects of fulfillment and collects these, um, these various projects uh, on, online in, uh, in different formats. And, and for um, the kind of motivating project for this, which is linked to the, the, the title of today's session, what, what had to do with questions of friction and error in this thing we call the supply chain, which tends to be um, imagined as a kind of seamless and smooth system, which in, indeed is a fiction. And so the idea with this research was to look at those moments where the kind of irritant is introduced into an otherwise apparently seamless process and, and what kinds of what kind of what kinds of aspects of that system are revealed once it starts to uh, either kind of not function according to plan or 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 veer off the tracks or something like that? And so, um, these were this was some of the motivation that led me to to try to understand something like 
Walmart, which um, really was not the goal of the research. I really started by being curious about questions of, of what the supply chain is and what logistics is. And the way I thought best to study that would be to look at something like, uh, you know, a really large corporate organization that would help to um, understand that. And so the, so Walmart became the kind of um, obvious target. Walmart, as you may or may not know, is a large um, discount retailer. They are based in Northwest Arkansas, which is sort of in the Southern Midwestern part of the United States. Uh, they also happen to be one of the, the largest corporation uh, on the planet. Uh, last year, they, uh, they brought in $500 billion. Um, and so compared to their next the rival, this is just l l it's large in terms of, of income. Uh, they're competing with, with China State Grid, with Sinopec, with uh, China National Petroleum, with Shell. So these companies, so, so for example, Shell Oil brought in $311 billion last year. So from an architectural point of view, from an urban point of view, this um, raises lots of questions because something like Walmart requires architecture to survive. So how does a company based in a rural part of the country um, become this international behemoth, one of the ways they do it is through their buildings, through the way they deploy their architecture and through the way they connect it through an infrastructural logistical system. And so the research of the book was to understand first, could just kind of like, basically like, how does that even happen? And then what does that mean for buildings? What does that mean for territory? What does that mean for bodies? What does that mean for us? And what does that mean for this territory, the neighborhood, the area that they're actually located in? Um, just to contextualize that at a kind of geo geopolitical level, uh, if you were to put that uh, as a GDP, this would be somewhere between Sweden and Poland. Um, and this is where you see Walmart is the blue dot uh, in the middle of the screen in uh, Northwest Arkansas. And what this, this diagram is showing is the expansion of the, of the company over the years, so I don't know how well it shows up on, on the screen, but this is a year, we're in 1972 now, and every so often you'll see a red dot that will appear. The blue dots are the stores, and the red dots are the distribution centers. And the distribution centers appear to, almost as kind of pressure relief valves. They, they basically um, are built to help the, the territory expand, but also to help relieve the stress on the distribution network. And so one of the things you also probably are noticing is that the, the the, the blue dots are growing outward. Um, and I realized that as I'm showing this, we're seeing a lot of maps like this, but they're not showing Walmart's spreading. They're showing a different kind of, of spread. Uh, but there is a certain kind of relationship to a kind of um, you know, epidemic, if you want, in the sense that there's a certain kind of connectivity that's implicated here and a certain mode of transmission, uh, including the sort of vectors of things like the freeway system here. So you see these, these faint lines, those, um, this is a, an interstate highway and you can see that every, um, basically that's every six hours by, I'm sorry, every four hours by car, you can see there's another store. So, so for me, this is a way, this is a map that shows both the kind of territorial logic, but then also an infrastructural understanding. And um, so the book, part of the book then works, as I said, at, at scale, it tries to understand the sort of organizational dimensions of the company. It, it tries to understand how they use their buildings as territorial instruments and how they build those um, through a flexible system of basically prototypical conditions. And um, I'm not gonna go through through all, all of these, but there is a kind of transcalar, multi-scalar approach to this, which is about um, different levels of, of engagement and activity, but then also different technologies that support those. So I just will talk about a couple of really kind of key features of these technological elements. Uh, one is the barcode, which is the first um, machine language written by and for machines. So this is one of the first times that a computer, a system of communication was really devised for machines to communicate with each other, uh, which would then optimize and, and, and accelerate the process of inventory management um, initially for, um, for industrial processes, but eventually, of course, with the retail system. And I love this image because it talks about the simultaneity of the barcode as both an object and as a piece of information showing a human hand actually disassembling it. This is from 1975, so this was sort of a pre-digital pre version of this. Um, it also shows how the barcode works really as a series of, of, of uh, binary zeros and ones uh, being physically assembled. And so, 
And then here there's this strange hand sort of presence. So this also talks about the sort of role of the human as always sort of implicated in this. And the, I think the, one of the things that the barcode does is it, um, it toggles things or it, it produces a kind of machinic double or a data double of objects. So anything that is sort of barcode encoded then functions sort of as a piece of data in a management system, but it also remains attached to like a resolutely physical thing, which is then one of the, the fundamental challenges of, of uh, logistics, which is how do you keep all that stuff moving around? Um, and so that spills out into the territory of logistical space where objects are abstracted into pieces of data. But then I think that same idea uh, spills out into the environment itself. And you can see that in this image uh, where the, the warehouse facility is drawn in the same way that the abstracted data modules, the kind of energon cubes of, of this environment are then uh, being manipulated. So, so in other words, inventory gets abstracted by logistics and part of the barcode and that same idea spills outward into to the, the built environment that supports it, which I think continues to spill outward throughout uh, a territorial level. And then that territorial level is, is super political. It actually exists on top of political definitions. So here, these are distribution zones for Walmart showing how the, the, their areas of concern don't really, cons don't really consider the state borders. They really concern, concern um, functional, some functional concerns the performance of, of speed and delivery, how quickly something can get uh, from a distribution center to a fleet of stores. And, and these things, I think it's important to understand them not as stable boundaries, but these things are elastic, they're mutable, they're constantly shifting, as opposed to the kind of fixed political boundaries, say, of the states. And so with those sort of three pieces in mind, the, 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 the relationship between the physical and the digital, the the spilling out of abstraction into territory and then the, the mutability and elasticity of that political territory. One of the cores of the book is about the actual built elements of the company uh, through a series of drawings of their elements. So here, this is a distribution center showing the different functions of how these switch buildings work, which basically take a certain amount of inventory, reorganize it and bring it into these trucks that then uh, deliver it to the local retail outlets, which then allow that to uh, be displayed, collected, purchased. And then here at the level of the cash registers, that's where these objects then leave the system because that's when the barcode is scanned for the last time. That scanned barcode is sent then to a data center or a series of data centers to be stored, uh, compiled, and then, and then used as a forecasting system to be able to understand consumer behavior and then um, predict or at least um, help guide strategic decision-making about where to direct purchasing actions, which have implications, of course, all the way upstream in a supply chain, all the way to you know, how much wheat should be grown, et cetera. Uh, these buildings here, you, you see this is a, a, a basically like a bunker. It's, it has a two-story earthen berm surrounding it as a way of um, both cooling it, but also help to obscuring it from the public's imagination. And those buildings, that the, the data, the, the, sorry, the super centers, so-called the, the retail stores, one of the ways that they can, that well, the company can build them so quickly is uh, by designing them as a series of prototypes. So the top, I mean, this is the, the blue figure ground um, image of, the, of, a, of a prototype and the, the bottom three drawings are the three instantiations of that prototype. Each one a little different, but if you, co if you superimpose them, what you see is there's this relatively stable interior, which is all of the kind of logistically scripted uh, shelves of, of of, of um, purchasing, of display and, and consumption. But this edge, this kind of um, uh, flexible edge becomes this, the kind of squishy matter that, that allows the, the tightly scripted interior to adapt to an unpredictable exterior. So basically the architecture is how the risk of the site is mitigated. It's how the unpredictability of locality is then um, basically translated uh, through this buffer. And so part of that uh, idea then um, fed into a project, and this was the project at Seoul where I met Harun and Deborah. Um, w as I was making these drawings, we, I was fascinated by the way that first it kind of revealed an interchangeability of these infrastructural systems. Then it made me think that maybe actually these logistical elements work partly because there's a kind of universality or like an adaptability to them. 
And then in the, the people helping me in my office, that we were having discussions about how to think outside of logistics because there, there's a certain kind of relentlessness to these systems that are so focused on efficiency, so focused on speed. So we started having these really fun conversations over lunch about you know where what things don't benefit from efficiency, what things can't help if they're faster, you know, and so we were thinking about things like sleep or romance or these kinds of things that just don't benefit from like expedite, expediting. And um, that led us to a kind of um, irrational way of trying to think through this and, and started a series of conversations about sort of surrealist games, which, which made us think about um, cadaver skis. So the exquisite corpse game where different people would draw a body and then a head and then a, and, a, a, and legs, but you would never know how the creature would come together until the game was over and it was revealed. And so we thought, you know, is there a way we could sort of automate that through these interchangeable pieces of this drawing? And so basically we took the, the, the elements of these, these um, relatively dry and descriptive drawings of Walmart system. And then we, we pr produced a series of belts that were automatically controlled by a kind of, um, by a simple step motor and Arduino system that would then sh toggle back and forth to produce a series of, different configurations. And sometimes those made sense. Sometimes, I'm sorry, usually it didn't, it was just kind of noise, but occasionally uh, they would kind of snap into place and they would suggest another kind of, of latent typology, let's say that they would merge data center and distribution center and shopping facility, which I think for me was a really kind of powerful uh, trigger. And in a way I think resonates with some of the things that um, we were just hearing about, you know, how a kind of piece of fiction could then actually start to generate um, a kind of potential reality, and and that's in a way led, has led to my um to my own sort of thinking about my own design work lately, and um and I couldn't help this. I love this sort of so I've been thinking about paralogistics and the sort of para prefix, so the paratype, the the par form, uh, and so so the um the relationship between uh, paradolia and perhaps the latent um, suffix in parades work. The idea that you can sort of see um, faces in things that are not sort of meant to be, that aren't there. Um, and I find this, this idea to be really powerful in the context of, say, of this discussion where, where part of what we do maybe as designers is exactly that. We find latent possibilities in something that was sort of never imagined that way. We see something, we interpret something in a different way, uh, and then think about how that might actually trigger some other parallel world or some other kind of, of reality. And as I've, you know, I'm a, I don't have a depth, in-depth knowledge about um, Paradolia, but what I've, understood about it is it's partly a kind of subconscious reflex. Like one of the reasons that we all tend to have this ability to, to recognize faces in patterns uh, that suggested at the most minimal level is linked to the, to the kind of autonomic nervous system. It's linked to our kind of fight or flight response. And we want to be able to, to, to sort of uh, feel something before we kind of even recognize it. And so I think there's something also about this relationship between let's say design and Intuition. So on the screen is this this mound and on the surface of Mars that was um, just because of the way the shadow happened to be uh, observers saw this as a face and then assumed, of course, that that life was there. And so in a way, we find what we're looking for, which is another thing I think is sort of key uh, here in design. And so for me, just to quickly, these notions of these these kind of guiding principles. The paratype is kind of linked to what um, how Walmart uses a prototype as something. Um, both sort of um well it's sort of un, un, uncooked in a way ready to be deployed and ready to be sort of instantiated once it meets its context and i should add i think one of the things i like about the para prefix is that it's both sort of parallel in the sense of, sort of outside of something but also anticipatory in the sense of you know the paramedic like you know here in advance of something ready for something and um with the um the notion of the, the, the physical residual, I mean, one of the things that I've been discovering uh, in the research into the sort of so-called lean operations of logistics is that in order for something to be, to function really leanly, it, it needs to have this incredible kind of material surplus in the background. So, so um, like the Walmart prototype, there's a, there's a degree of inefficiency that makes um, these efficient operations possible. So, um, with that, I just I show two quick few projects quickly that that have tried to explore this. The first is the, is a project called Shelf Life, that was a response to um, that was a, the, our, my entry for the PS1 um, Young Architects program uh, as one of the five finalists. This was done with um, 
with Aisha Ghosh, Jesse McCormick, and Zach White. Um, and it was, uh, it began actually in, by investigating some of the very kind of dumb materiality of logistics, which is the, the supply space, the rack itself, these um, pallet racks that are these robust material systems that basically make logistics possible by housing all of this stuff. And um, we realized this was a really um, robust and kind of underdeveloped element that we that we thought actually had a lot of possibilities for exploration, partly because of its scale and partly because of its um, its availability. So they're actually quite abundant. Uh, and and so we thought, you know, what would happen if we really just sort of took these? How could we we take advantage of this material abundance to activate the PS1 courtyard in uh, a way that would recontextualize it, but also help people maybe or offer a, a new range of experiences that might not otherwise be available if we really um, if we could really pack it. So one of the benefits of having all this materiality, all this this abundant uh, stuff, is that you can really you can really uh, create a new environment uh, through a cheap and flexible way, which is one of the kind of big constraints of that um, project. You have a very limited time to install it, and you have a very limited budget uh, given the scale. So the project is a series of these racks that are arranged in rows, and then and then pieces are removed to create what we call clearings. There's a series of what we call stacks, which are these uh, adapted furniture elements that fit within the, the, the dimension of the module. And then there's a, a, there's a series of linear elements that we call tracks. And those things help with navigation, but they also provide atmosphere like light and um, fog to help cool the space, in, which is a, usually a very hot space in the summertime. And here it is situated in the PS1 courtyard, which has these two um, geometrical uh, spaces, one sort of square and then triangle. But there's, you see there's this rotation that has to be uh, overcome. Uh, so this is just a detail of how these things would work. They would all be kind of off the shelf, of course, and then all temporarily installed. So this was a really key thing for us. The racks uh, wouldn't be anything we would encumber in a permanent way. We would basically borrow them from the supplier. They would install them. We would install these custom pieces, uh, but out of off the shelf material. And after the summer was over, it would all go back into the logistics uh, stream. And I think one of the things Spatially, that, that, that I found really intriguing about this is when you take something that's a kind of, it's a fairly um, banal object like the rack, once you start to accumulate them, something else starts to happen. It produces a certain kind of scalelessness, a certain kind of, of, of almost hallucinogenic or kaleidoscopic uh, aspect emerges out of this where there's a certain kind of density and overlap and a kind of shimmering uh, of, of space that occurs. And I think that was something that became really exciting to us because you could actually embed all of these different qualities of spaces within uh, the project. And so the idea was that, that we would all, we started talking about this as a kind of enchanted course mm -hmm. of logistics, something you would discover, something you would sort of find your way into, and you might not know what would be um, waiting for you as you, as you uh, emerged. And so this project, we were not, um, we were the runner up, um, but, but um, yeah, the system is quite adaptable. And so one of the ideas now I'm, I'm continuing to look for ways to, um, deploy it given its, uh, its flexibility. So we're thinking of this really as a kind of public space prototype. Um, and that, that it happens that the place that, um, that was willing to, to, don't, to lend all of this material to us is located in a part of the world um, that's currently behind me on my, my screen. This is the New Jersey Meadowlands, which is um, an incredible landscape in the New York City region. And um, so the, 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 the second and final project that I want to share today is this project. Um, currently, uh, the title of it is Public Facility Meadowlands. And this, the idea is this is part of a larger project about these public facilities. But this is initially um, with support from the New York State Council for the Arts and with the New Jersey Institute of Technology, um, a, for, a former um, institution of mine, with um, also the PS1 team and, and also Jake Rosenwald, who've been helping me um, develop it. And it's it starts with um, an interest in this landscape as potentially a public landscape, but with maybe not a kind of um, totally uh, clear public yet. And it's really um, this just to kind of explain what, what's going on with this place. It's um, it's it's just over the river from New York, just over the Hudson. It's it's almost the same size, and it's uh, it's a series of marshland that has been then. Um, used over the last two centuries for all sorts of infrastructural uses, including um, transport. So here you see it's riven with tracks and highways and pipelines. 
uh, it's been a site of, it's the current, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, it became a significant site of radio broadcasting, partly because of the, the openness, but also because of the brackish water helps with signal propagation. Um, it's an incredible site of infrastructural storage, liquid natural gas, energy production, and then of course landfills. It's, it's famously the kind of um, landfill uh, zone of New York City next to Staten Island. Uh, if you watch The Sopranos, this is the landscape that the opening credits uh, happen in, which is how a lot of people know the Meadowlands. Um, and so this, the project here was to look at these three sites as a kind of metabolic system. So input, output, exchange, and the input being you know, something like the, the, the landfills, the exchange being the energy tanks and the output being the radios. All of these things work together, in fact, to make this large logistical landscape not included here. And this is why it's sort of still work in progress. The uh, data center industry is really major presence here, as is the distribution uh, industry. It also happens to be one of the most polluted sites in the, the country. This CERCLA is the so-called Superfund site. This is the, the United States' um, project to uh, mediate, mitigate and remediate very polluted landscapes. Uh, it happens to be then a really active ecological system as well. So it's a giant wetland, which has been incredibly important for um, dealing with questions of, 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 of water quality and flooding. But it also, as you can see on the right, um, there are all of these collisions between development and uh, growth. The growth is, in, in fact, the growth of the, of the, of the office parks collides with the, the marshland, but the marshlands themselves are not anything near what we would imagine as a kind of pure nature. This is, um, this is the Phragmites uh, grass, which is this incredibly invasive, but also still fairly helpful uh, uh, plant that helps, helps with uh, water purification, but is incredibly invasive as a species. So these, all these sort of ambiguities and complications here, and in spite of all that, this, this incredibly fascinating uh, ecosystem emerges. This, this site also is prone to flooding when Hurricane Sandy uh, hit the region. Um, uh, a lot of these places were inundated. And so you can see on the right, uh, this is a typical response, which is to basically build a wall around a building, but the marshlands actually can, can do a lot of work to support this. Uh, it also is the site of uh, a giant mega mall that recently opened called the American Dream. Uh, this has been a long kind of going project that's constantly getting frustrated. Um, and its luck is not any better. It opened uh, to the public in February of 2020, just in time for everything to get shut down. So, so the fate of this thing, which includes a ski slope and an aquatic park and on and on and on, um, continues to be a, a kind of, um, well, it's a feature of the landscape that's, that continues to, to animate it. And then finally, there's a cultural dimension to this. I mean, in terms of, of kind of cultural production, this is Robert Smithson's monuments, tour of the monuments of Passaic, uh, which is, his, his trip through basically where he grew up. He grew up in, in nearby the town of Patterson. And um, this was him taking a bus from the Port Authority and looking at all of these industrial sites and, and, and then write, writing them as if he saw them for the first time, understanding them as a kind of monument to contemporary society. And so I think this in a way has been part of the kind of motivation for some of the work that I'll show in a, uh, in a moment. And then um, his partner, Nancy Holt, also has been working here. This is a project called um, called Sky Mound, which was actually one of the early projects to really look at how to transform a landfill that had been decommissioned into a kind of, um, I don't know, almost a kind of, of uh, geomantic observation uh, system. So with, with that in the background as kind of what the Meadowlands is, uh, we've undertaken a series of documentary exercises to describe the, meadow, the, the mounds, that, which are the landfills, the towers, and these tanks. Uh, we've collected those into a series of, of almost like field guide posters. The, the idea with these is they'll be printed and installed in the, the commuter train system of the region so that people can, passengers can maybe see these and that might help contribute to a greater understanding of the, 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 this huge net network of infrastructural systems that are surrounding them. Um, and in that process, we also became really fascinated by the small industrial and infrastructural elements. This is a, an image from from uh, an engraving from the 18th century, I'm sorry, from the 19th century in, in England from Victoria, Victoria de Palma's book, Wasteland uh, History. But I love this image because of the way that it talks about this relationship of the three, these three windmills as a kind of navigational system. And that led, I think, to an interest in the potential of some of the, the current industrial vernacular 
of the Meadowlands, including things like the drawbridges. This is the control tower for one of them. This is the photo of that, that building uh, in, inside a bridge, basically. Uh, so we documented these as well, or we're still doing that, the different kinds of industrial vernacular elements. And from that, we've then extracted and distilled a series of design ideas, a kind of a vocabulary that then we're looking at how we can mutate and recombine them into a series of installations throughout the region. And that's shown here. These are, these are the 16 sites that we've identified as kind of key points within the, the Meadowlands, either as kind of activators or as connectors, and are currently in the process of, of developing them. So these are, I show you them in a little more detail. Uh, so we've developed them first as a kind of aerial, almost like a kind of glyph, uh, simple, simple kind of logo type element, and then are in the process of, of developing them as um, uh, more refined responses. And here are three, um, three I just show you very quickly. So the first is a, is a observation uh, deck and uh, soil remediation facility over one of the really um, polluted sites in the area. You see it's a kind of the vestige of two of a rail line splitting. It's this triangular uh, zone here. And so the project really takes um, a series of linear elements and then a series of processing facilities to produce basically a, a, a mediating device between the, the parking lot and this strip mall and this vast territory of the Meadowlands on the other side. So you'd be able to make your way up and then congregate, well, hopefully once we can congregate again. Um, and to be able to basically engage the site while still not being able to physically engage it because of its toxicity. Um, this one, which is more of a public a recreational facility, this one, one of the things that it would do beyond allowing access to the river would make this, would bridge a gap here, which is this um, defunct drawbridge. And if, if this gap were closed, the entire network would be then accessible to, um, to the public. You could basically walk around the entire region or cycle around the entire area, but this is the sort of one missing link in the process. And so the facility is basically like um, changing areas on a boathouse, um, and then covered by this large canopy roof. And then finally, this one um, would be a kind of seed laboratory that would look at um, ways of thinking about developing uh, different kinds of horticultural and agricultural uh, aspects within the Meadowlands to partly deal with some of the Phragmites um, issues. And so, so we've been trying to take some of the basic kind of building blocks of these industrial vernacular sheds and then just do maybe one or two um, intensifying moves to them, extending them or, or repeating them to start to find maybe a, a contemporary uh, language for this territory. So this is an overview of that. Um, and then just to kind of recap of some of the things I've been showing. So the Meadowlands project is very much in progress. I think one of the, one of the, it's almost the sort of the opposite direction of the, of the Pylon-esque project in the sense that um, no one's asked for this. <laughs> so so we're, um, this for me has been a really, it's just, it's a site of, of, of intense interest on my part. Um, but now we're hoping to find people who might be interested in um, developing it. And we're also working with um, you know, outreach to, to talk with some of the stakeholders and then um, to try to better understand the actual performative dimension, how we might, um, how we might, how these things might start to function in a more technical way to do some of the remediating or collecting work of the project. So um, I will leave it there um, a little bit longer than I meant, but, um, but let's i'm looking forward to uh, the discussion thank you again for um devin howden for the invitation and for ken actions for making this whole thing possible um i'm a big fan of the organization so it's really nice to be able to be part of it so i'll stop sharing my screen and, and then hopefully we'll have a chance to talk yeah um fantastic that was that was amazing thank you so much I mean, we definitely had a chance to catch up and get maybe I would say what turned out to be only a glimpse of what you're actually working on at the moment. So it's definitely interesting to see the kind of the, the, the full scale and the breadth of everything being involved. Um, I guess uh, maybe just to elaborate a bit on this theme, because I think you said it quite eloquently when you were talking about um, how we perceive of this thing to be a kind of very smooth process but actually it's quite glitchy, it's quite finicky. Um, mm. It's actually not. And, uh, and I remembered once uh, you, you referred to it as being a bit flabby and excessive. Mm. Um, I was just wondering if you might be able to elaborate a little bit more on some of those perceptual changes that have happened either through your own research and then maybe if there are instances where you kind of see that happening at a larger scale 
in the public realms as well. I mean, you talked about this thing of even in your Meadowlands project, kind of making part of the Meadowland visible. And um, I guess that, that idea of transparency and coming to terms with the, the kind of reality behind the curtain, so to speak. Well, yeah, it's been, it's been, um, it's been a really wild few months for this um, as someone who's been, I mean, you guys too, you know, being interested in how things get where they get. And uh, I mean, you know, I, the, 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 the projects that you showed too, I think are, are engaging this in a really fascinating way. So, so the idea of basically where does something come from and where does it go? I mean, these are elemental questions and you know, we, we, and I think bringing them out in, in architectural discourse, I think is really key beyond just the kind of notion of say like embedded energy or, or the kind of material histories of a building, but actually just the larger material systems and, and, and political and social systems that we're part of. I mean, it's all, it's all connected. And so I think in the last few months where we, when we see these images of these empty shelves, I think a lot of people are shocked by that image of, you know, how could this grocery store not have anything on the shelf? And I think what's important to remember is that that's always been the case. We just never see it. Uh, and so it's really like, um, you know, if you fill up a bathtub and let, let the water run, but then take the drain out, a lot of material is moving through that bathtub. But apparently it's not really changing. There's a certain level of equilibrium of some kind of homeostasis that's been created by the input and output, but the whole thing is sort of super turbulent if you were to look at the, you know, the whatever the different tree or something. So the um, what we what what happened with with the sort of the at least in the in North America where I've been, um, these empty these empty grocery store shelves have been a product of this um, what what some people call a demand shock, where suddenly um, suppliers couldn't anticipate the amount of of demand, and so this system that was otherwise in equilibrium got thrown out of whack. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it would, it's like turning the water off in a sense, or turning the water way down. And then you start to see the level drain, even though in a certain sense, the same, um, same there's still the same supply available. And, and it's just that, that there's, these things haven't been um, uh, anticipated in that way, or we never get to see the process. And so in that sense, it's revealed what is a kind of fic fiction for a lot of, uh, for a lot of us, that, that, that all of this is sort of smoothly um, happening. And the same thing is going with the, the kind of intense labor that makes all of these logistical systems uh, possible and all of the incredible um, uh, work and incredibly difficult work that goes into sustaining it. And so I think that's been, um, I think hopefully people are realizing that more and more that there's, there's implications to, to, to this thing. And, but it also, I think what I'm hoping, and I think this is where, you know, the, I guess the optimist in me is hoping that this is a chance to think about the kind of world that we want to make after this rather than than how do we restore the previous version but actually how do we use this moment of kind of revealing all of these fictions to then not sort of recover and restore them but to then create and uh, to use these use this moment use this moment of friction to then think about you know the new stories that we want to um to to tell I mean, for me, it was like uh, very interesting in this last project that you were presenting and how it's basically uh, self-initiated. And now that you are in the moment of basically uh, making it real or trying to make it real, I was wondering like what are like all of the steps that are necessary in order to uh, make it possible. No, I mean, I imagine that uh, changing policies it will be necessary, like somehow. I mean, you were like mentioning that some of the places are toxic. Usually those spaces are not allowed for, for us, for humans to go in. Right? So I, I was like, really wondering like, what is the scope of how much you have like, basically thought or research about it and how uh, you think that could be, could be a potential for, for further exploration? Well, I'm really, this is, I'm really hoping that this is one of those frictions that fictions that will become a, that will become real enough through the through, through insistence that then it will be allowed to happen. Um, I think because you're right. I mean, I think it, it, it exists in a very speculative way right now, and, and even a kind of like legalistic way. I think to make some of these things happen um, becomes becomes quite challenging. But I think that's for me. It's been a nice um, process from 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 my own development to, to get to a point where I now have a feeling of, of enough sort of conviction about it that I really want to try to find ways to make it possible. Um, and, 
and I think that 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 but I think that right now it's been somewhat self-contained and I think it's really important to me to make sure that, that there's connections with with th those people who might be involved with this place in a more daily daily way um so to not see this, this so much as a kind of imposition as a, as a kind of um as a way of, of sort of bringing something forth uh, that might be latent um I mean, I have been in conversations with some people who were involved, let's say, with development of this area, and there's been um, one of the challenges is, um, let's see, I don't know how well you can see it, but like back, let's see, <laughs> like right there, <laughs> so <laughs> is a series of landfills that um, have been recently re-entitled because of, of, of some really diligent and, and, and um, long, work hard hard and long legal work on the part of some developers to find ways to basically use these sites because they're and, and i think this is an interesting moment it's a, it's incredibly the whole, the whole site is incredibly t like compromised in general there's never going to be a place where this becomes a kind of um, nature again or like a wilderness again it's always going to be this sort of third order nature which i don't i think in this case is really fascinating there's all sorts of possibilities that come from here and so i think as a result that opens up a lot of possibilities for how it could develop and so one of the terms of this, this re-entitlement was that two landfills can be redeveloped, but only one can be actually built on. And so they're currently looking for what to do with the other one. They're, and so I think for me, you know, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm, this is just one example. I don't know if this would go, will um, develop, but it's been, it was an interesting conversation just to hear about the challenges of, of translating and, and reorganizing possibilities for these places. Um, I think that something as simple as, you know, as making a building a connection um, between a bridge that would then activate a whole network. I mean, I think that's, um, none of these things are so simple, certainly. Um, but I think that, the, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic that, or I, I mean, I continue to be excited about how to then use some of the tools of design to help these things seem, you know, enter into a sort of space of, of reality. This site has been, um, the side of design inquiry for, for some time. I mean, so I think the, the communities are a little bit maybe um, wary of this. So I think this is going to be another part of the of the process. But I think for me, like one of the things that I find really amazing about about um, the Pylon S project is the way that it takes. I mean, I think it does a lot of those things. Like it takes you guys. You found a kind of latent uh, system that was in place, and then through through an intervention, let that become more visible. I wonder, you know, in terms of this question of visibility. For me, I'm, I'm, you know, I guess I, I'm always curious about the degree to which that has an actual like behavioral impact versus just a kind of like a general uh, sort of ambient contribution to someone's knowledge. But you know, much, how much that knowledge then, or how much that information then gets translated into a sort of actable knowledge? Do you, in your, in that Pylon project, Pylon S project, do you have a sense of how it's changed the way people use the space or the resource? Or I mean, you know, has, has the fact that you exercise and help pump or the fact that it becomes a kind of very visible public way of collecting water has that had impacts on the way you know people have seen the whole system it's quite interesting because actually when we were trying to build it there was a lot of resistance from part of the direction of the school basically because uh, they were thinking that because water was coming through this channel uh, the water will stay there and then will like basically be an attractor for mosquitoes and so on mm -hmm. But basically, we were trying to explain them that actually we were like, of course, we were designed in such a way that water will not stay there and so on. And what happened is that little by little, uh, the construction workers started to become like, they realized that it worked because we were like basically calculating where the water was and so on. And actually, like all of this part, the gardenasium and so on, it was like very self-initiated. We proposed it, but because, I mean, the, the site was like quite far away from where we were one day we arrived and suddenly the plans happened without us telling them, no? So it, yeah. it was really, really initiated. And it was quite nice because when the photographer uh, went to take the pictures and so on, I mean, we were expecting, of course, we like that there was water, but somehow you were feeling like, oh, the light conditions and so on, no? But at the very end, it was beautiful that the day of the photographs, that was like one single day, you could clearly see that everything was more or less working. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that was in, in the behavior. Yeah, I mean, I, I think definitely, like, during the process, there was a lot of odd amount of excitement and skepticism and curiosity. So 
it wasn't just one day that we came back to the site and there had been new things. It was like every other day we were dreading going back to the site because they might have interpreted something and just went ahead and done it. And um, so, so that was always a surprise. I mean, we, we just wanted like two or three pieces of gym equipment and they brought the whole thing, you know, the whole parade of gym equipment. We're like, we don't need all this, just a few, please. So, so there, was, there was a lot of excitement and curiosity there. Um, and we, we actually, because it's in Thailand and we're not in Thailand anymore, um, but the, let's say the custodian, he was also like this master ship welder. So it's this very weird scenario where he was welding ships in Japan for a certain amount of years before returning to this small rural province in Thailand. And uh, so his knowledge on welding was like super key and he was really confident and he kind of welded the whole structure, just him in flip flops and very, uh, very casually. I mean, as, as actually the, the project, we didn't have like a very clear idea from the beginning. I mean, we have our interests, no? But usually when you're approaching this kind of community project, it is a bamboo project and so on. No? And when we arrived, and basically he was like, how do you say the, uh, not the, um, the one who is taking care of the school? The custodian. Uh, yeah, the custodian. Uh, he basically tells us like, I am going to be the one building it. I have no idea about bamboo, but I know a lot about welding. And suddenly you become super, super constrained, not only by that, but also because the local shop only has a metal structure and very cheap uh, roofing and so mm -hmm. on. So basically like you realize that all of what you are seeing around is actually made of the most available thing that you have, which at the very end, it ends up like being as it is, with the colors and so on because like that's what we were having available yeah yeah uh, pretty much what you what you end up seeing all around there are these industrial materials that are yeah. mass produced and very accessible in a strange way and, just that um, instead of walmart we were having scg yeah no? i mean different, different variances of that um yeah. but that was that was basically the language around there but then that's why it was also nice to try to re not reinvent but i think reinterpret um kind of mixing different typologies and systems together and and that little bit got definitely got the students curious i mean we don't speak thai either except for like hello and goodbye um but the kind of curiosity on their faces were there and they all had opinions about colors which yeah, was the renders part was really yeah, amazing we, we kind of like show them pictures like so which yeah. one do you guys like and i mean it was such a wide spectrum that you know there was really no winner in the end um but but I guess, I mean, just to get back to the, the question to some extent, it, it's kind of unfortunate that we're not in Thailand at the moment because I think we'd really love to see how the thing has come to life. But We cannot the, see it through Facebook, actually. Yeah, they exactly. have a Facebook page and they okay, upload okay. pictures. Yeah, we were thinking if we should add it actually to the, to the yeah, presentation. But the custodian guy, we're still in touch with him. So yeah. we'll, we'll use Google Translate to send him a message, ask him like, hey, how's it going? How are the kids liking it? And he'll just send us back a few photos. And they seem to be enjoying it. So, um, so so far, at least, yeah, it seems yeah. kind of nice. Is it a kind of project that could be also because there's a feeling that it has a kind of prototypical dimension, and, and the way you describe it as is this kind of evolution of an industrial vernacular. Do you think it's it could be something that you could sort of instantiate in different places? Like it seems like it could start to become a kind of a type almost. I mean, there is definitely, I mean, if there were like a documentation of the architecture there, you will see that all of the roofs are the same material as we are using, just that they are using thousands of different colors. And all of this also comes from this kind of Thai culture of using colors and so on, which is embedded into whatever type of vernacular that they have. And then uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, and the, the, the roof, this, how do you call it? The canvas. The red canvas that you see, this is also like a very common uh, Thai element that is in all of the buildings as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think in the sense that it, it is a module, um, but the module is just repeated, offset, and sometimes cut. Mm -hmm. So in the floor plan, you'll see like those two core umbrella modules are actually made up of like four other modules. Mm -hmm. And essentially things can be laid out flat and essentially mass produced. And so what was kind of neat, uh, working with the fabricators on site, let's say, or the construction workers on site, uh, was how hard it was for them to kind of get their head around why we're cutting these weird angles. Mm. But once they accepted that it worked, mm. it just became a production chain. 
And mm. but I think by the the amount of time that it took to to make this thing, because it is systematized in a kind of I, I think it deals with like this logistical production chain process. Um, if they were to do it again now, I think it would probably take about maybe two weeks, right? Yeah. Like it, they could zoom through it now that they've kind of gotten over the mental and physical hurdles. Um, That's so interesting that it's like a mental hurdle in a way, like the sort of belief in it uh, mm -hmm. more than, than the kind of uh, actual physical act of doing it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Also how it depends the, I mean, if we had to build this project here in Spain, we will never do it uh, by hand. It will always be joints that will be all of them drilled, right? It will be like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. But then when we were like thinking there, no, we were observing like all of these pylons, how they were made. And we were like actually quite surprised because they were made by hand. Because of course, it's very cheap to build it because mm -hmm. labor is very cheap. So mm -hmm. all of that also like somehow uh, yeah. influenced the, I mean, the, they are not Japanese in the way that they are able to do the details and so on, but they are definitely quite skilled. And all of that also allows you for certain, I mean, when everyone saw the design, they were like, it's hard, but it will, like the first one, it will be hard, but the other ones will be very quick because they are like very, like, they basically make it. And the first one and afterwards, like they became quite professionals and masters. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think, um, kind of just thinking about some of the things that you were showing, uh, I'm kind of curious about this idea of the redrawing of the boundaries. And I think mm. it's always fascinating when a corporate entity finds a way to, to bend or stretch beyond other mm. types of territories. And I guess I'm kind of curious about in, in the case of the Meadowlands, how is, is the Meadowland considered just one lump land or does it kind of cross over into different boundaries and different types of classifications of territory where only certain things can happen in certain areas. It's, it's, um, it's this kind of crazy patchwork of land use and multi, multiple jurisdictions. Um, there's been, uh, there's a number of different uh, efforts that have gone uh, to try to organize it. So um, different kinds of, of entities, planning authorities, or um, Agencies or nonprofit groups have all sort of um, tried to to um, to deal with it. So there was there was a um, it used to like in the in the um, until let's say relatively recently until the last few years there was an agent or an organization called the New Jersey Meadowlands Commission that was a kind of regional agency that would over that was meant to kind of oversee it partly through a kind of kind of conservation effort. And that became that they the Christie administration changed its name to the New Jersey Sports Authority, um, Sports and Exposition Authority, and that was sort of to link to then again to the um, to that which is the um, the the stadium and the, the major sort of attractions here. So this is where the Super Bowl was held, the big football American football championship from um, a few years ago, and the um, there's some so this the 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 site also there's the, the Port Authority. Which leases that, that's the uh, the agency that runs the, the commuter line, but also they lease. They have a lot of land that they lease to energy companies. Um, there's several different townships and jurisdictions that way, um, and so it's this incredibly complicated process uh, in terms of that. And I think that there's not. I mean, with the um, well, one of the things that I find um, so fascinating about the that map of Walmart with those territorial blobs is that what creates those blobs is infrastructure and architecture. You know, it's not, it's not, um, it's not a cartel, it's not a sort of a political decision that then is sort of with a survey creates an imaginary line uh, on a map. It's actually through the performance, like those, those shapes are, play, are, are sort of played out through performance rather than the other way around. So it's not that there's a shape determined and then that affects performance. And, and, and the, um, the, U, the US has a really, and you, we're seeing it, especially now, this sort of strange, um, the relationship between the states and the, the, the larger country is quite fraught. And, and there's a lot of challenge, there's a lot of tension always between local and, and national control over things which we're seeing now in, in really high relief with, with COVID relief. 
But this uh, Walmart map doesn't care about any of that stuff. It's really about just you know the performance of it. So in a certain way, I've like I've thought of it more in a way. It's a bit more like a watershed map or something. You know, where there's a certain kind of set of performance criteria, and those just determine that the shape is a precipitate of that, um, not the other way around. And I think that there's um, I didn't include the uh, the the, um, the map, but there's some of the early surveys of the West. Um, like, like John Wesley Powell, one of an early surveyor, had a really amazing proposal for how Western territory should be organized. And it was around access to water. So basically, um, there's no California possible in that version because um, California, as we, or at least Southern California, depends so substantially on remote water. And so it's preposterous in a certain way to build uh, a city like Los Angeles. Um, Resource-wise, but it happened anyway, or like Las Vegas, resource-wise. So, so his idea was that you, you know, you organize settlements around access to resources, um, and so that that in a way it's a similar kind of spirit, um, but then from a totally different mindset around you know, organizing territory around the sort of speed and and availability of of things, and so all of it rests on a certain kind of assumption. And again, I think that that's one of these things that our current moment is asking us to reconsider, which is the degree to which we've, we've become fairly dependent on a, on a so-called just-in-time process. And I think we're seeing the kind of you know, the limitations to that and also the, the kind of precarity of that at all these levels, whether it's just simply the availability of things, but then also the kind of labor that goes into that and the exploitation that goes into that. So, so for example, here in Canada, people are concerned about what the food supply chain will look like for the fall because the growing season is now beginning. And so um, because there's a lot of constrictions on labor movement um, from, from over the Canadian border, there's a labor shortage or potentially a labor shortage for, um, for which, which has been never a kind of great system, but um, that will have consequences in terms of the yield uh, and then in terms of prices and availability and all that. So, so these things that happen now in, in April will have consequences in, in October. And these are the things that, that you know, have been so calibrated, but also again, kind of kept out of sight. So those all are somehow intertwined in terms of sort of imagining the, the kind of, um, what the kind of like uh, zone around all of these elements, the kind of zone of influence or something that's constantly being kind of re, um, reconfigured. And I think that's, you know, for me, I, when I was hearing you guys talk about the follicle project, I, I'm really excited to see the maps because it, it's like this sort of inverse, you know, like you take, you take this, this piece of data and then you sort of let that tell you what the map looks like. So there's this kind of uh, deductive process in a way you get the data and then it, it tells you what the territory looks like. It reveals its portrait. Uh, and I, I think for me, and maybe this is also, I mean, maybe we, we talked a little bit before this about some representational conversations and one of the, one of the, and it's linked to the earlier question about what the sort of role of revelation is, you know, does it just generate information or can it actually help produce knowledge? And, and I think one of these, the kind of cartographic um, impulse, you know, which I share, you know, I, I wonder about it how, it, how it can be effective, you know, in terms of, of what it's broadcasting and the kind of way it can be made legible. So, so one of the things for me that's been really um, perplexing, but you know, fascinating and, and a little scary is the way that logistical environments are, as they're increasingly automated because of the barcode, increasingly become illegible to humans because um, the logics that organize them are, though human generated through in the sense that someone like wrote the algorithm, the product of that, like the actual uh, manifestation of that is so much faster than we can sort of comprehend. It becomes this like totally illegible landscape that has a totally reordered um, system to it. And so I, I guess I'm curious, like it seems like that there's there's really fascinating patterns that can emerge, but then almost like you know another sort of vision necessary to um, to decode them. So I'm not sure if that if that direct, relates directly to the to the follicle project, but it does seem like there, there's something about that, you know, like these sort of unexpected sets of data that then might reveal some aspect of of, of the city that we never really sort of imagined was there before, because the the it almost kind of neutralizes the 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 kind of latent biases in data collection. Yeah, yeah, I mean, the, somehow uh, what you just started talking about, at least towards the very end, it started making me think about even the, um, for example, the, the, the face on Mars, right? Like it's this, um, it's really just a lump with some shadows mm -hmm. and we're mm -hmm. trying to make sense mm -hmm. of these patterns. And I think when you're talking about 
this um, they're, they're, the how maybe algorithms are going to well they already are starting to write um, spaces for mm -hmm. themselves and operate for themselves then they become increasingly more distanced uh, from human interpretation and maybe that's unsettling in a, in a weird way um, mm -hmm. but at the same time it's always fascinating so it's always uh, double-sided right to, mm -hmm. to see this unscripted or unplanned thing generate itself and not be able to really comprehend its underlying logics or be able to decode it as mm -hmm. you said mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I'm just thinking kind of towards the future how if that's ever something that we might come to terms with right like if you look at the face on Mars and then the face it's kind of not really a face or if it's a kind of disfigured face right like all those types of impressions that you get from it it starts to kind of reshape your your relationship with it so almost in the same way that maybe at least for us dealing with this idea of mapping and the visualization of mapping we were at this moment where those very early ones that you saw kind of are, are pretty much the first impulse right um, there's a there's a map there's some data and we can graph it three-dimensionally and that tells you something but it, we also have this um that's again like the very first thing that we've done just to get a sense of what's going on but we don't necessarily feel that that form of representation does uh justice to to what the project is really trying to convey in a way and we're trying to wrestle with this glitch this inherent glitch that exists between how we intuitively read information and how we cognitively understand information. Um, so some of the interesting things were, we were, we were looking at um, those kinds of conversations on uh, line chats, right? Like people sending each other these messages um, with different screenshots about how polluted is uh, this area of Bangkok, right? So well, how different it is, different, same place different applications, you know, like those moments of this containment that is like, why, why are like the, the pollution completely different? Not some point they were saying like, is someone controlling it? Is not and so on. Right. Or like even the, the color schemes, like you, you, you think it's yellow, orange and red and you think red is the worst you can get. Uh, and then one day purple appears and you're like, oh my God, we're in purple. What does that mean? So there's, there's a, I mean, it's, it's definitely biased. And I think that's one thing that interest us about it. Um, it there's just no way to divorce uh, mm -hmm. the the emotional attachment you can you can lose the emotional attachment but um, that would just be a very boring map right and then um, but very you can also objectified. very objectified and, uh, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really communicate what it needs to so in a way we're, we're struggling with this balance of how do you part how do you impart information um, how can it also be um, it may be experiential, and how does it get out of this kind of language that everything is represented through a, what do you call that, like almost a one-to-one -one relationship, right? Like this line represents exactly what it represents, and there's there's nothing beyond that. So we're trying to think of ways to And to we are also out. trying to connect it back to the city. I mean, basically what we are like getting now is results of, I don't know, arsenic or aluminum or magnesium. And what mm -hmm. we are starting to see is that there are certain correlations that, for instance, in the center of Bangkok, there is a very large amount of people who has more cadmium. And that amount is directly related to uh, the fact that there is a very big highway in the city. Mm -hmm. So what we are trying is to somehow not generate a map that it is like um, just placing data, but that there is like a correlation with what is in the city and how you can like basically understand the city not only um, understand the invisible agents of the city that are actually affecting your body that it can even constitute some kind of urban uh, um, uh, or, or urban ma master planning no but that there is not a, there is not physical per se uh, yeah, that's yeah i mean it, and it's nice because I, I mean there's this element where it starts to re retell you a story about the city that you didn't know and as you said kind of reveal this portrait figure so one of the earlier things we, we did was kind of represent, uh, like we, we, we sent out the first five batches of hair samples and we got them back and we basically mm -hmm. made um, some kind of portraits, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But these portraits were... Mm -hmm. uh, Not figure, human they weren't Yeah, they weren't the figure. They were framed, they were treated as a portrait, kind of mm -hmm. looking head on, directly on, but what it was was the data kind of 
um, formulating this topography or this figure. Mm -hmm. So, so it was this kind of dual play on that exact thing. We call them mm -hmm. toxic portraits mm -hmm. at the time. Um, well, that's that's so interesting because I think I mean, I'm just thinking about the um, you know this this question of image and legibility. I mean, this is animated urban design discourse for so long. Um, and in a way, I feel like we're, you know, we're, we're still searching for kind of how to update that conversation. And so, so the Meadowlands, for example, is adjacent to Jersey City, which um, um, if, uh, which one of the kind of protagonist, like, well, not protagonist, one of the kind of um, um, counter examples in Kevin Lynch's image of the city, Jersey City as this kind of, um, you know, impossible uh, place for, from Lynch's point of view, because there was no sort of order to it, there was no coherence. It was this like, just like impossible place. And in a certain sense, that's totally true in the Meadowlands. And I think it's linked to what you're describing, you know, because I think there's maybe there's other models for thinking through what it means to sort of think about design or planning or organization that, that one would sort of acknowledge that, that the sort of new technology exists, but then also that there's other ways of, of, of navigating or other ways of sort of making sense of something. I mean, I think that it's, it's not to say that I think we have to sort of abandon some idea of kind of, 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 of sort of legibility, but just to not think of it as something that's maybe imposed, but maybe something that is sort of uh, teased out, you know, something that's latent that then gets sort of um, identified, maybe, maybe catalyzed, maybe intensified. But I mean, without, without sort of suspending judgment completely, but also being sort of curious about sort of, I guess, what's, what's already there and how that can kind of come forward. Yeah. But then how that can add up to uh, to an urban uh, urban process. I, I guess I mean for me it seems like it's linked to also an idea about um, you know I guess to to, to how urban transformation happens, um, mm -hmm. and, and it seems like we're, we we have to work hard to to um, to think about this city as something that isn't just um, you know built by developers. And I feel like that's maybe this is something that's a kind of North American bias, but I feel like it's there's there's often this assumption that like that's how cities are made and mm -hmm. i think that, that, that finding ways outside of that uh paradigm is increasingly important and i think something like finding other tools to to bring that about whether that's through engaging other like you know sensory dimensions or other organizational dimensions or mm -hmm. other other you know, visualization dimensions i think all of that can be linked to seeking out uh these different uh, approaches but it's difficult because there's you know it's not it's there's nothing sort of easy to fall back on mm -hmm. uh, which i think is partly linked to you know to, to some of the other discussions we had at the beginning around um or some of the preliminary discussions about the kind of um you know the, these conditions that we're finding ourselves attracted to these kind of wasteland conditions so-called um and the, the 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 misnomers often applied to them um and I think so. So, for example, the Meadowlands is often um, described as a post-industrial landscape, but in fact, it's incredibly active as an industrial place. It just isn't a, a site of factories anymore, but mm -hmm. it's still um, it's still incredibly active as an it's, as an industrial industrial space. Just the industry is the data industry, and the industry is high-speed trading, and the industry is is distribution. These are all industries. They're just not the kind of manufacturing that we think of when we think of like you know industrial um, assembly lines. And so, so it's just, this is a long way to say that I think these kind of new tools help us to find ways outside of the conditions that brought about the landscapes we're reacting to. And I think this is one of the big challenges is to, to get ourselves out of the, mm -hmm. the paradigm that generated this system in the first place. Something that uh, happened to us and like with one of our students, I mean, we were working on toxic uh, landscapes and what happened to us is that basically uh, there was one case study that was in Australia, I think it was called Wittenum, it's like one of these asbestos mines. It has been removed from maps, so it's extremely hard to get information. And well. one, of the, one of the students what, uh, was able to get into a Facebook group. And through Facebook, she was able to get all of the information of history of the users, how they were perceiving it, and so on. No? Like currently, there are like just three or four uh, inhabitants and it, I mean, basically, uh, that place has become like a, a spot for tourism. So like this notion of toxic tourism that somehow uh, I was thinking that could even be related with, uh, with your latest project. And then mm. somehow I was thinking like also how the, 
uh, community could start to become like an active force in moving your project forward. No, like I was thinking how uh, these uh, posters that you are generating of mapping different infrastructures could start to become uh, like a force for the for the community to start to understand mm -hmm. the site that they are neighbors with. Which I'm not sure what is the relationship, but that it could like be much uh, like much more in conjunction, no? That the understanding of that place could start to become really better. Even the, like kind of building up off of, off of that and the notion of vision um, or giving visibility to something. Uh, I, I struggle with visibility as being maybe the only means to, to, to do it. Granted, it's the easiest one, I think, and the most accessible for most people. But, but part of it always feels, and I think you, you mentioned something along these lines too, about um, rendering something visible, but then ultimately people are spectating. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's really hard to break the comfort of spectating and getting into this, um, getting your hands dirty, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, at least for us, it gets us questioning, and maybe that's why um, the Gardenasium part of Pylonesk was so nice, was because it, it just forces you if you want to take care of the plants or if you want to get water out you you have to engage right like it's not enough just to kind of sit back and watch the water and and it can be fun and it can be pleasurable and somehow i mean without sounding too corny about it but there there is this um there is this invisible barrier that exists somehow when things are just rendered visible and i just don't feel or i don't think we feel that that in itself is somehow enough right i mean i think we all watch bad news all day long, but nobody, right, the, the catalyst, uh, and maybe part of that lends itself to this idea of tools, um, not just as maybe tools of representation, but the tools for, for action, so to speak. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And also, like, uh, sorry. Uh, on, no, no, I'm probably building a little bit on what Hadding was mentioning, no? like sometimes what we are trying is to analyze places, not by scene, but what uh, much more tangible, uh, realities no like for instance in the follicle project uh, like the fact of using we could have done the same pavilion without human hair i mean the pavilion where people go and cut their hair and so on didn't need it to have hair no but the fact of using some material that it provokes that it really like somehow calls your attention calls your like uh, senses to touch to like smell and so on it really like uh, it, it, we remember things in a different way. It, it makes like a different way of process the information that it is not necessarily just by visual no? or like even reading. I think this is, I mean, I think that what you're, um, yeah, this idea of like, how, I mean, in a way it, it's, it, um, there are these almost kind of basic things like how, how does a place become meaningful or how does it resonate? How does it become uh, resonant beyond the kind of instant of consumption, and I, I think we're you know the, the your example of the beach shows this so sort of uh, plainly the kind of experience economy that privileges the collection of of these kinds of experiences over something else, and, and how that's maybe shifted from from a, from more of a kind of physical collection, physical consumption of things, but to a collection of and consumption of experiences. Versus like thinking about how space, you know, how, how productive spaces get produced or how, um, how, how there's moments of that. And I, I think, because I, I share your, your concerns about this sort of visibility project. And I think certainly I, I'm, you know, one of the things I'm sensitive to and, and aware of is that there's a certain kind of assumption that one can, a set of assumptions one can sort of also easily uh, fall into mistakenly to, to think that, you know, by that, that maybe this, there's a lot of people who know a lot more about this landscape than I do, certainly. And there are a lot of people who there's a, there's there's incredible communities in the Meadowlands, for example, who are really active in shaping it and maintaining it. And there, there's, for example, this incredible river keepers group that have become that are incredibly um, uh, effective advocates and activists in the, in the place. And so, the, you know, to, to not to make sure that those things are not sort of. Um, um, you know, th th that's where I, I'm looking to, to sort of find some guidance about it. But I, I think there's, there's a lot of like, you know, understanding uh, and, and knowledge about the place that is not just sort of consuming it. But, um, but yeah, I think that the, I think that this question about how, how things kind of stick or somehow how things, how things resonate, I think is really um, important. And I guess this is what's been really um, strange about this moment um, that we're currently in because none of the things 
you know, that we're talking about are possible right now. And I think this is one of my kind of, when I get more, my, my concerns about this whole, all of this is that the, um, the I mean, well, I don't know, the, 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 the kind of, one of the outcomes of this is, is the kind of dream in a way of the kind of um, neoliberal smart city, which is that we're all doing exactly this, like sitting alone by ourselves, talking to screens, ordering things remotely. I mean, those of us who, you know, who of course have the luxury to be able to do that, um, to be able to have a place to, to be quarantined in and have access to high speed internet like we do. Um, even so, it's, you know, it's just sort of fragmenting us into individual, separate individuals um, and, and sort of foreclosing on this possibility of the collective. And so people, I think uh, there's a search for that, uh, for outlets through that, through the, through the platforms we have available. But, but a lot of the things we're talking about still depend on a certain kind of, of collective dimension. And I think for me, that's the sort of the performative, the productive dimension of public space comes you know, back, I guess, more to the kind of political roots of it more than the kind of warm and fuzzy roots, but more like this is the place where the public can sort of be visible uh, and, and can be disruptive when it needs to be. Um, and I think that's, um, that's something that's really, that, that you know, we're, we're sort of at, at this moment, this is, um, that would come at, at, at great risk somehow health-wise, but this, this is where, this is, this is the kind of flare up the friction at the moment, of course, in the US is again, this exact question, how, what's the role of government to, to uh, determine how people can be in their cities uh, and and so this notion of uh, how much where where is trust uh, related and how that plays out in urban spaces, I think, is unfolding in front of us. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I mean, the it, it's funny because when we were, we were living in Japan um, for for a number of years, three three years, almost four years, and uh, it's funny to think about that role of government because in Japan, I think the West is learning a little bit, not. I'm not pinning it as the West always needs to learn from the East and so forth. I think that's a, not at all how I'm trying to say it. But the, um, one of the interesting things is that, it, at least for us, culturally speaking, when you're in Japan, uh, there's just police are like the friendliest people there. Um, mm -hmm. And they're, they really don't make you twitch. I mean, you can ask them anything and, you know, you can even stumble to them completely drunk with a beer in your hand. And the most they'll do is point you to a cab or help you get home somehow, right? And um, because the pressure is in fact spread around uh, the society to keep each other in check. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's the thing that in the West we've um, never necessarily had. There's always been this uh, kind of punk attitude, which isn't necessarily good or bad, right? It's more on just kind of reflecting on our experiences and making some observations. But at least for me, it feels like maybe it's some of the first times that responsibility, collective responsibility, becomes um, enforced by individual action. So mm -hmm. we've been seeing people on Instagram calling out their friends like, hey, you shouldn't be out there and like making it public uh, mm -hmm. as a public shaming so mm -hmm. as to get them back in check, right? So it's, mm -hmm. it's this interesting moment in the West where governance, um, which we normally separate from government and the people, it started to kind of become government is dictating a set of rules, but people are also forming their own sort of governmental mm -hmm. logics and rules, whether or not they're predicated on actual law almost doesn't matter, right? It's like this um, survival instinct and mm -hmm. how sensitive you are to it. Um, it will dictate who your friends are in the end based on their actions yeah. and a kind mm -hmm. of collective individual responsibility. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We are seeing it also with our neighbors when we go out with a dog and so on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was quite funny. The other day we were in that elevator and we're on the 11th floor and it went down to like the fourth floor. It stopped at the fourth floor and we wanted to get to the ground floor. And as it opened, uh, there's somebody who wants to get in the elevator. And we had this moment of looking at each other, right? And in our eyes, we're thinking, don't you dare. <laughs> and in their eyes, they're thinking, I don't care. So mm -hmm. they just stepped in and it was this uh, interesting moment where we're like, okay, how do we... How do you react in this moment? Do you quite physically remove the person from the elevator? Do you step out? It's mm -hmm. awkward beyond um, beyond awkwardness, right? Like there's a whole other dimension that you have to consider, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of reshakes all those social norms because we've never mm -hmm. lived through this before. We've never mm -hmm. lived in a condition where you can't be within proximity, right? So how do you politely ask somebody to leave? Um, mm -hmm. Is always a it's always a tricky one, and I, I think it's somehow rewriting a lot of the social norms. Mm -hmm. 
hopefully in a positive sense. Right. Right. It's just like this, there's this kind of paradox about, you know, we, everyone's, I think, looking for support, but none of us can be around each other. Or even, I mean, we were both talking earlier about the kind of the video project from, from Andrasaka and Eva Manera from yesterday's World Around um, conference that we were both watching streaming. <laughs> and and uh, there was, it struck me that in that image, there were some amazing images in some of the, the scenes of how this is manifesting spatially around the kinds of, of built forms that reinforce those spatial rules. So like that there was like an image of an elevator with like little platforms that were suitably distant. So you could have three people in an elevator facing the wall if they stood on the flat platform. And so I guess this is this is why I think for me to kind of try to maybe to bring it back into some of the questions of the space and territory and architecture that these are um yeah there's all this has a kind of physical dimension to it. And so I think that this um which again will sort of play into some public or even just you know even even domestic space uh, dimensions, and so I think I wonder. I mean, I guess I'm, I'm wondering how much we sort of hope that this, you know, how I I, I mean, this is what everyone's talking about. Like, how, how much of this do we just sort of imagine will then eventually pass, or mm -hmm. how much of this is sort of rewriting so many of the things that we that we were doing? I mean, everything, every project that I showed today, I think also you guys you know, if we were to design it in a kind of COVID rule, like none of these would it be possible or it would be, it would even be even more utopian or somehow because they would imagine a kind of post, a post COVID uh, world somehow. Um, it's, it's been strange even just along that because the, um, I have the feeling that maybe, I'm, I'm really curious almost to, to get a, an actual poll on this, but how many people, because you mentioned of course, and I think we all would prefer that when or if things go, if COVID goes away and we can continue, um, how do we, we of course don't want it to go back to the way things were, but uh, I have a feeling or I'm really curious to know how many people are fine with things going back the way they were, right? Like how much more can you stand to this? <laughs> that you would be like, please let us just go back to the normal grind. It was fine, <laughs> check to check, right, right, right. fine. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. It's just a kind of curiosity. But probably well, I think that this is, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say that probably to end, we could, I mean, we have a poll with all our, all of our, like our network of people. And we are asking like, when do we think that this, if at some point gets to normal, when will it be? So, I mean, we have like, uh, the most positive one is- Well, uh, don't, don't tell you. Ah, no, we don't tell you yet. Okay. We'll so let you, you know after you guess. If, if you can probably tell us your guess and probably in the future we can see who, who won it. Yeah. So like just to give us a month and a year that you think things will go back to normal. Of course, normal is vague. We're not trying to be too specific. Um, you can set up the terms of what normal is, but when we can be active again, get out on the streets. Um, yeah. If you have a month and date in mind. Uh, I think it's going to be like two years. Something like that. Okay. You know, I thought like about that. this before. That was a quick answer. <laughs> Well, it's part of our conversation in the universities, you know, everyone's wondering, how do we start? What do we do? Um, but I don't know. I think it's going to take a while. Do you want to know where you place on the optimist or pessimist spectrum? <laughs> I hope it's, I hope, uh, yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> well, we have some super optimists that are like, oh yeah, in June. Mm -hmm. like this year, June okay. is fine. <laughs> uh, and then we have, uh, I think we're, we're kind of optimistic. We're like January. No, I am. April or uh, March? She's April or March 2021. Mm -hmm. I'm January 2021. And then we have some friends who are along those lines. Wherever verbatim the quote was, uh, wherever you are now is where you're going to be for the next two years. Mm. So, so that's where you are. So, so. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I, the other way to say it would be that there's, there's, it will, it will, it will be, you know, there's, it's like one of these moments of just like fundamental transformation, you know, yeah. a bit like, um, we're just, I mean, like, like, like pre, and I, I think we're getting into like, we're getting into just kind of like a slightly meandering conversation, but I do think that the, um, you know, these sort of epochal moments of shifts, so, you know, like 91, I mean, sorry, like 89, 2001, now 2019, 2020, these are moments where like new institutions form, new regulations form. I mean, I think how easy it was to fly before 2001 relatively you know and then post 9 11 then suddenly you take your shoes off 
So here, I think it will be a similar set, just like the kind of mobility restrictions, uh, just as one example, but like all the things that will start to happen as, as a reaction to this. Um, but this is much more of, a, I don't know, yeah, it seems like it's much more fundamental because it's revealing all the things that we've been sort of getting lucky with for so long. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's just like showing how, how frail and, and, and precarious all of it's been. And so I think that's where I, I, I don't think there's, I think the notion of, of sort of what it is that we're sort of getting back to, I think is really important to be really clear about, as you're saying, you know, that it's, that we try to sort of figure out what, I don't know where, where to, I mean, so for example, like Canada, Canada just rolled out a, a relief bill for students, which is really enlightening. I really, or like I find, you know, there's, it's, it's not to say that there's, there's not flaws here with this government but i mean for me instead of seeing it as like how do we bail out corporations it's to say how do we help students get through yeah. the summer who don't, don't have jobs is has been um you know one little bright spot i guess um, yeah i mean just thank you so much for for joining us uh it's great to see you after so many years even if it's just through a screen for now um i i hope we can definitely be in touch and um and let's see if uh, if we can set up another one of these, maybe. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks to you guys, and thanks to thanks to Anastasia and, and Connections. I mean, I, I do think I do hope that, that you know anyone anyone who's still with us listening, uh, <laughs> I would love to uh, to to and to you know have a chance to to engage any questions that might be out there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, let's um, Deborah and, and Howden, let's let's stay in touch sooner than later because I think that, that we should find ways to sort of you know do something about these shared interests. I think there's a lot of uh, possibilities here. So let's, let's figure something out.